Oh boy, in this episode, 10 traits of successful lifters. If you know somebody that's very successful, has been doing it for a long time, get, get, gets great results, doesn't have a lot of injuries, looks amazing, chances are they have all 10 of the traits that we talk about in this episode. Now, here's the giveaway for today's YouTube podcast. Here's what we're giving away, the Prime Bundle. That includes Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro. Great for correcting muscle imbalances, improving mobility, reducing pain. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to that incredible bundle. Also, we've put together three bundles in January for three different types of people. Beginners, intermediate, and advanced, okay? All three of the bundles include nine months of exercise programming, all mapped out, exercise demos, videos, the whole nine, okay? Here's what you do if you want to sign up. Head over to Maps january.com and then you can click on one of the bundles and sign up also if you just want to do one maps program if you've never tried a maps program you want to try one do maps anabolic we're putting that one 50 off if to get that one go to mapsred.com and then use the code january 50 for that discount all right here comes the show all right so here's what we did uh with today's episode we talked about uh, successful lifters people who are successful long term who've been working out for a long time what are the traits that they have that contribute to their long-term success? Let's talk about that a little bit. I like this. Yeah. I think we narrowed it down to 10, the right? common the, characteristics they all share. Totally, 100%. And I think, I think we should all aspire to, to have this, right? If we don't, I mean, would you say, I would say that you're pretty good with all these, right? I'd like to think that I'm pretty good with most of these now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it took, me, are, it took me a while to get here, but I think we're here. Totally. Yeah. And these, these are important to know because um, I don't think, I think majority of people, when they start working out, they're, they're not trying to get, in shape and out of shape, right? They want long-term success. Although I'm sure the primary motiv motivation is short-term. Nobody wants to lose weight and gain it back or mm -hmm. you know, do well only to hurt themselves and have to stop working out. So let's talk about the traits that make people successful uh, long-term across the board and uh, ultimately also produce the best uh, results. I think the first one, this is very important, is when you find somebody who's a really successful lifter, you'll find that they prioritize technique and form with their exercise. Mm -hmm. They look at exercises like a skill, and that's that means that those exercises produce the best results when they're done properly, just like any other skill. If you do, It's not just about sweating and getting sore. It's about doing it right because that's how you derive the most benefit. This is one of those things I, I <clears throat> walk into a gym, I immediately notice that. Yes. It's like sticks out of the crowd um like a shining beacon because i that this is one of those things i'm always trying to reiterate and, and to educate my clients of the importance of it uh it's just going to carry your progress so much further forward into the future and you're not going to have to battle all these uh things that come with um you know not maintaining that proper form and technique it's such an attractive quality when you see too when you see somebody who like moves with like beautiful form now, what would you say uh, is the the mindset that that person has to go into the gym, right? So when you go in the gym, like you, everybody, I don't think anybody goes in thinking like I'm going to go have shitty form. Yeah. But you know, there there is like you said, Justin, when you walk in, it's very obvious. You can mm -hmm. see somebody who, who is very meticulous about their form. And what do you think it is about their mindset when that's they go? such a good question? I, I'm going to give you an analogy. Uh, imagine somebody who goes on a basketball court with a basketball and thinks to themselves, "I'm just going to sweat." Right versus somebody who says, I'm going to go and, and get really good at basketball. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in the technique and the form and the focus. And so I think it's when people go to the gym and they understand that a squat done properly is extremely valuable. A squat done improperly not only is not valuable, but becomes uh, a liability. Well, I guess to kind of keep in the basketball analogy, I look at hustle, right? Like I am very impressed with uh, the effort. You know, I see some athletes put out there and they're the ones getting all the rebounds and they're doing all the things, but they have no handles. Yeah. And, you know, there's just certain things I notice that, you know, I, I'm very attracted to, you know, the, the athlete that, that tries, gives it all, like leaves their heart out there mm -hmm. in the field. But, you know, the, the ones that really like take it a step further are the ones that master the, the technique that they need to, uh, you know, have that kind of a skill. Mm -hmm. I think part of that comes with uh, 
these little rituals. I bet you guys don't even realize that you do this in almost every exercise you do, even something as simple as a tricep pushdown. I mean, when I walk up to a cable machine, and I'm going to take a basic, because obviously squatting and deadlifting, there's definite rituals that yeah. we all know that you kind of go and check through for. But even something as basic as a tricep pushdown on a cable machine, I mean, I'll, I'll walk into it. I get in a certain distance from it. I, you know, puff my chest out mm -hmm. a little bit. I pull the shoulders back and peel them down. I grab the handle. I suck the elbows in. Like there's this ritual that I've created to prepare myself mm -hmm. to go into that movement so that I can repeat it with perfect form. And that's been years of practice like that. And so yeah, I think that you, you, the mindset is going into every movement with kind of this r ritual to get really in tune with their body. Yeah. Get, getting you into this, this, this perfect position and, and knowing that the first few times that you do this, it won't be perfect, but you're working towards that and you're, you're trying to create these habits so that you can get into that rhythm as quick as you can. And I think that great lifters have, have learned to do this over time. And they probably, like I said, you guys probably don't even realize this, but you do this on every basis. 100 percent yeah, uh, yeah yeah when you said that i right away thought of every exercise that i'll do and i do i have a mm -hmm. position i get mm -hmm. into i know how to get in the right well, you position. grip with your hands the right feel. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything exactly. now that takes us to the next one which is connected which is that uh really successful lifters practice foundational lifts and they practice them often so practice is different than working out practice literally means i'm walking up to the squat rack and I'm practicing my form. I'm practicing my technique. I'm getting better at the skill of squatting or the skill of deadlifting or the skill of an overhead press or a row or a bench press, right? These are all considered foundational lifts. You'll notice that really, really skilled lifters are skilled in those lifts. They know how to position themselves where the weight should be on their foot. They position their knees right, and they consistently practice the technique over and over again. So I know we know all, you know people talk about variety with your workouts and stuff, but you'll find successful lifters with foundational lifts actually do those quite consistently. This one took me a little bit longer. The first one I felt like as soon as I became a trainer, uh, I became very meticulous mm -hmm. about form, uh, but I did neglect a lot of the foundational lifts because they were hard. Mm. because they were hard because they, they got me gassed and out of breath and they were difficult to get the form down. Yeah. I tended to avoid these movements. It wasn't until later in my career did I re first realize how important those movements were and then two realize that I don't need to like kill myself. So I was still early on as a young trainer caught in that like intensity trap of thinking that every workout needed to be a failure and training the shit out of myself every time I entered the gym it took me years to get to a place where, you know, sometimes I go to the gym and I'm like, I'm not trying to crush myself. I actually just, I'm going to go practice a few movements and get really good at them. And then it took even more years to go by before I started to realize the, the, the biggest bang for your buck movements, which are those foundational lifts you're talking about and get good at practicing those. Well, yeah. these specific lifts are just, um, it, 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 they look simple, right? On the outside when you're coming in and, um, and, and to your point of them being hard and, and a lot of times like, you know, intermediate to beginner level lifters will avoid some of them because you can get good muscle pumps. You can get stimulated in other ways, but, uh, what it provides you is just so much more, uh, involved in terms of your entire body and, and, and training your, your body as a, a whole. Uh, and, and so this is one of those things you don't master this until like decades, like, uh, these types of lifts. And so to keep sharpening them, keep practicing them continuously, you start to see all kinds of different types of benefits that your body receives, uh, you know, that translate to everything else. Yeah, they're complex lifts. Uh, they involve a lot of the central nervous system. They fire a lot of muscles. You should list some of them so people yeah, know what you mean. Barbell squat, right? Your overhead press, your deadlift, deadlift. your rows, uh, pull-ups, your horizontal presses, like your bench presses, your incline presses. Like those are considered foundational lifts. And they just have tremendous bang for, for their buck uh, results. Like a, a barbell squat will do so much more for your lower body than, you know, five other lower body exercises usually. And that's just to show how effective they are. You know, about eight years into my career as a trainer, I'll never forget this. I had uh, clients that at this point I'd started to get good and clients would stay with me. And then one of my strategies was, okay, you train with me now three days a week, but eventually I'll move you to two days a week, one day a week, and then you'll do workouts on your own. But they, you know, it was always tough when they would go on their own. They would always either work out too hard or apply intensity wrong or do something a little off. So then it dawned on me and I told my clients, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to work out on your own anymore. When you go to the gym, I want you to practice these four lifts. Just go and get good at them. Don't worry about how hard you're working out. Just practice them. And everybody's results exploded because of the mentality. 
it wasn't about I'm going to go get my legs tired and sore. It was I got to get better at the squat. It wasn't I'm going to hammer my shoulders. It was I got to practice my overhead press. That practice mentality produced some of the best results I'd ever seen in clients. And of course, applying it to myself made a big difference. Now, Adam, you mentioned intensity. Intensity is one of the tools in your tool belt when it comes to getting your body to respond and adapt and change. But experienced, successful lifters understand that like any tool, okay. mm -hmm. there's an appropriate time to use it, and then there's a time to put it away. So it's like you have a hammer. You're not going to use a hammer to screw screws into the wall and to plaster the walls. And I mean, you could try, but it's a terrible tool to do all those things, right? Intensity, a lot of people, people are not successful. This is that like, you know, like the commercial with the big red button that you hit for everything. Yeah. People use intensity for everything, hard, all the time. And that's a terrible approach. You manipulate intensity and use it the right way, and then it works for you. Burnout is a real thing. I mean, it's you can you can overdo it. There is the right dose that that applied, uh, your body will respond to and and you know adapt and take you further forward. Once you figure that out, like how to manipulate uh, the right amount of intensity uh, for your programming, and so that's going to really you know set you apart and. and it, it, it contradicts a lot of, you know, from the athletic world, uh, what, what's being pushed from a lot of coaches of, you know, showing up and, and giving like 100, 110% and like mm -hmm. no pain, no gain. Um, because, you know, at certain point, you understand that, um, you know, it's not benefiting you. It's actually deterring you from, you know, progressing forward. Your strength is actually something that is a great indicator whether or not you're having success with your application or not. Well, it also contradicts some of the studies, you know. Right before we got on the podcast, Sal's going back and forth with the doctor right now. And like one of the things we're talking about cardio, right? We've been debating cardio lately. And, you know, the, of course, the doctor, you know, throws like one study out that proves, tries to prove his point. And this is one of the, the things that drove me crazy as a young trainer was I, I was reading these studies. And this is what drove my programming mm -hmm. and my thinking is I'd read a study that's talked about the benefits of training to failure or intensity and like what that does for more muscle growth. And so my thought process is, oh my God, like there, I, I'm going to get more muscle, the more intense that I train or training to failure is going to benefit me. So then I was applying every workout like that, but it's not that simple. Like we don't, we don't live in this six week, you know, bubble of, you know, the controlled environment. There's so many other factors with stress and sleep and diet and everything else that's going on in your, in your life that you can't just take a study and say, oh, like in, in this six week window, when people do this, they see extra, mm -hmm. this much more benefit from it. And that's one of the problems that I have with our space is there's a lot of these studies that are out there that are, that were done either to support the sale of a supplement or support an idea before they even came into it. And so I was reading this stuff and thinking that this was the way to train. So this one took a long time yep. for me to, to not only one, learn that that was not good advice and wrong. And then two, what you're saying, Justin, is find that, that sweet spot. Like what, well, if, if it's not, I'm not supposed to train this way all the time. When do I train this way? And what, what is too much? Like this took a long time to figure yeah, out. Here, here's a hint, right? If you're a hardcore lifter, you've been working out for a long time. Do you come back from a layoff stronger? If you do, you were probably overplying intensity, maybe volume as well. Studies show that those those uh, those period those weeks where people deload is when they start to see the biggest gains, right? So intensity is definitely important. Okay, intensity is essential for for results when it comes to resistance training, but it must be applied appropriately. And experienced, successful lifters understand that they know when to apply the intensity and when to back off the intensity. That's the important. That's the thing that we're we're explaining here. It's not that intensity is not important. It is, but if you apply it all the time at a high level, it's going to work against you 100% guaranteed. Well, and it's not and it's not necessary to to apply it so hard in order to build maximal muscle. For what I mean by that is like when you you talk about the mechanic, you talk about the uh the mailman, like yeah. you give that example like a mechanic is not wrenching with all his effort. Every, yeah. I mean, he just, but what he's, he's, he's frequently doing that yeah. every single day over. And he's building muscle over he, Yeah. Weeks. And, and you've ever seen their forms and then seen how strong they are. If anybody's ever worked with their dad, who maybe is blue collar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I remember the first time that I, I, my dad does, con, my dad did construction. And I remember the first time, you know, I hammered some nails with him for the day. And it was like an hour in. And I was just like, I needed to take a break because my forms were so pumped and on fire. And he's just hammering away. Yeah. Like it was no thing because, and they, so he's built, 
built muscle and got strong and adapted over years of doing that. And he did not have to, you know, apply crazy right. amounts of intensity. To get In other there. words, it all, when applied properly and appropriately, will contribute to your goals. And intensity needs to be manipulated just like uh, the other factors. Here's another one. Um, experienced successful lifters aim to optimize efficiency. So what does that mean? Well, that means if two exercises does the benefit and the effects of five exercises, they're going to do the two exercises. That means if they can get a certain amount of results with a 45-minute workout, they're not going to do a 60-minute workout or 90-minute workout, right? If they can get great results four days a week, uh, six days a week, if it doesn't really derive them any additional benefit, they're not going to do it. See, a lot of people who are not in this category of really successful lifters, they don't necessarily understand that. What they tend to do, and I get this because I fall into this trap as well, is rather than training for optimal results, we tend to push to the limit and get away with what our body can tolerate. And there's a very big difference, right? Your body may be able to tolerate this level of intensity, volume, and training frequency, but the optimum amount is somewhere over here. That means all this extra work that you're doing is not only just wasting time, but probably taking away from your body's ability to adapt and progress. So really good, successful lifters are always thinking about optimizing efficiency. Am I doing the best? In, in, what do you, what's that saying you say, Adam? I was just going to say, this is my favorite one to yeah. communicate. It's, and our goal is to do the least amount as possible to elicit the most amount of change. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and and what it does too, not not only are you optimizing at the, at the moment, but you're also setting yourself up to break plateaus in the future. Totally. If I'm doing the least amount to, to elicit the most amount of change, okay, that means I'm seeing change from doing the little bit I have to, to your point, doing only two sets to get the benefits that somebody may be doing five sets. What it sets me up for is eventually I can scale to three, to four, to five sets right. because I didn't come out the gates right away throwing the whole kitchen sink. And I think this is common. I think when people get motivated to get in the gym, whether it's to build muscle or to burn body fat or in improve performance, they, they go from not doing anything to all of a sudden doing everything that they can or everything mm -hmm. that they can tolerate, like mm -hmm. you said. And the truth is, that's not what we should be doing. We should actually be doing as little as we possibly can to elicit change. And if I'm seeing change week over week, I'm progressing. And, that's an, and when you're thinking about years and a lifetime of training, you want to set yourself up to where you're, you're you're constantly seeing results and not that you get somewhere really quick and then you hit this hard plateau that you can never break. Well, and this is a tough one because um, as you're lifting over the years and you get better in a certain direction, you keep adding, right? And I keep adding more exercises and more of the same. Uh, and then you don't quite see that same type of progress yeah. uh, to where this isn't even one of the points, but one of the things that I've noticed too is the ability to shift into a completely different phase or a different type of mm -hmm. modality mm -hmm. and having that kind of um, ability to step outside your comfort zone and and be vulnerable again and be and suck at something to get good uh, in order to benefit the whole. And yep. so th this is just something it does fall in line with this because we love uh, once we get good at something, we love it. Right. right. And we just want to keep adding. And, and that doesn't necessarily always take you, you know, further. No, yeah. that, that's such a great point. And that does fall under this this point because that is optimizing efficiency. At one point, no matter how good you start and how perfect you program, eventually the body will adapt to whatever it is that you're currently doing. And it takes a lot. It ha takes somebody who is always trying to optimize to go, hey, you know what? I probably too should switch this modality to something that maybe yep. I don't like doing as much. Like, I don't really care for the strong man lifts and doing some of these old timey stuff, mm -hmm. but I know that I never do that. And there's tremendous benefits from moving that way. Or, oh man, I know I'm not, I don't like doing the mobility stuff stuff and I'm not I don't like doing all the multi-plane shit or stability work that stuff's boring to me but it's like I never do that and if I want to continue to optimize and see results and benefits the best thing I can do is to move away from what I'm currently doing no that's true because the mistake is that people think if some is good more is better and mm -hmm. that's not uh, necessarily true and also by the way this is true now backed by studies and experience that as you work out over years and years and years there's this Almost it looks like a bell curve in terms of how your body responds to volume, frequency, and intensity. And yes, as you progress, more volume, more frequency, and all that stuff gives you better results. But then at some point, it starts to drop off. I know this now, right? I can build more muscle now with less work. In fact, I'll build less muscle with more work now. As I'm older and I've been doing this for a long time. Now, when I was younger, I had to do a little bit more 
to get the same kind of results. So it's about that efficiency and optimizing it. And that's what makes a lot of these lifters successful, especially in the long term. Here's another one. And this is just, this is uh, such an important fact. And my goal as a, as a trainer, when I became good at what I did, was to really get my clients to love the journey. I knew that if my clients loved the process, not the goal, not the fat loss, not the perfect body, not the looking good, not the big arms or the nice butt, but rather love the you know, walking in the morning and the resistance training twice a week and love the prepare, you know, preparation of healthy food and eating fresh whole foods, right? If they love that, then the results were automatic. It was a side effect of this journey that they enjoyed. You know, if you love walking, you'll walk five miles, 10 miles, 100 miles, it doesn't matter, you're gonna continue doing it. So if you fall in love with the journey, and this takes time, but if you put your mind there and make it happen, you're gonna get all the results and you're gonna keep getting the results because the journey is what gets you there. I don't think this is a successful thing for lifting. I think this is a successful thing for life. Totally. I think that th this idea of, uh, mm -hmm. and we talk in the pursuit of, a success and money uh, that this works the same way too. Like if you are hung up on the end result or the goal or the the, the financial pinnacle that you're chasing, uh, you'll find what happens to people that finally reach that uh, they're unhappy, and that's because they missed out on where. I mean, the great book, The Alchemist. That's what this is all about. It's it's all about the journey and becoming present and enjoying what you're currently in. Mm -hmm. Which is another reason why, too. Not only do we want to start because it's more beneficial with the least amount possible to elicit the most amount of change, but it's also important for learning to like. Let's say you you honestly don't like to work out, and you because I've had clients that Adam, I don't like working out. I hate exercise. I don't like and and but you're you're trying. I'm here. I want to make an effort. Well, one of the worst things you could do with a client or a person that has that attitude about already about working out is to throw a ton of stuff at them right away. It's like, let's start to make some little subtle changes in them and let's mm -hmm. see if I can get them to start to like it. I mean, how many things have you guys not liked? And then eventually after you kind of tried it a little bit or to implement it, oh my God. then you start to like it more. Then you eventually start to love it. The same process happens with becoming like this really good lifter is maybe you didn't love lifting at first, but maybe part of the reason why you didn't was because you failed at it so miserably because you threw so much shit at it right away. Instead, why don't you focus on a few things that, and then, and then not only focus on those few things, but think about the things that it improves out in your life that not everybody talks about, like the weight loss, the muscle building, the butt, the things like that. But the improved energy, yes. the libido, the sleep, your attitude, your energy and throughout even the just day. There's so many other factors. There's so many other us. factors. Yeah. yeah, and even just the process. Just yeah. list loving the process. Like right now, if you're watching this, like imagine if you just enjoyed the process mm -hmm. of exercise and you enjoyed the process of eating healthy and enjoyed the process of taking care of yourself, right? It'll always happen because it's something you enjoy. And the process is ultimately what gets you there anyway. Well, it's to, to Adam's point. This is like a life lesson. I mean, this is, this is about growth. And this is about, you know, and you, you see that. And this is why I love about fitness is because you, you see tangible results, you know, as you're in it. Yeah. And, um, you know, you don't always get that immediately. But, um, you know, as you're going through hardships, as you're going through, you know that there's, there's, you know, there's, there's silver linings, there's lessons, there's, there's things that you can extract and take uh, throughout the entire process that you can focus on that aren't always negative and are, are things that provide you with, with knowledge and experience and, and ways to, you know, approach things differently uh, coming, you know, forward. Yeah. Now the next one is somewhat connected to this and that is that, uh, that successful lifters are disciplined not motivated, okay, it's a big difference. Now, that doesn't mean they don't get motivated, but like all people, like all humans, they go through periods of motivation and unmotivation, but the thing that's different about them is that they're always consistent. Now, there is a difference between discipline and obsession, right? Obsession takes away from other aspects of your life. It decreases your quality of life. It's addictive, right? Discipline adds to the quality of your life. Discipline is like this with exercise. Right now I'm motivated, I'm hyped, I'm having hard workouts, I'm hitting PRs, I'm having a good time. Or right now I'm not feeling very good, I'm not very motivated, I'm gonna go to the gym, I'm gonna take care of myself, make myself feel better. Uh, or I've had this terrible thing happen in my life, I'm gonna go to the gym, give myself a little bit of space, give myself some 
time to be present, care for myself to keep myself healthy. So it becomes this tool that is molded and modified for everyday life. And you're just consistent because it's discipline. Discipline says, I get up and I do this regardless of how I feel, mm -hmm. regardless of what's going on it's in my life. It's absolutely connected to the one before. The only way you're going to learn all the other benefits or learn to love the journey is to first start with the discipline. And the first thing that comes to mind besides God, it's loving the discipline though. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So the, what comes to mind was, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't start reading until I was in like my mid twenties. Obviously I read like the basic stuff that I had to read through school, but I did it cause I had to do it and I hated it. It was miserable. <sighs> I was miserable reading. And when I would when I would read as a kid when I was in school, I'd be reading and I'd be like, I have to do this. And all I was connecting to was all the things that I didn't like about it. Yeah. This was sucking my time. I could be playing video games. I could be hanging out with my girlfriend. I could be playing basketball. Like, I'm slow at reading. I hate doing this. I lose my train of thought. So I'm all I'm thinking about is this loop of all the things I don't like about it. And so I, when I got out of school, of course, I was not wanting to read. There's no reason for me to do it. I hated that. I'm out of school. I'm done. I don't have to do it. I'm an adult now. Why would I want to do yeah. that? And it wasn't until later on in my life that I see all the other benefits, but it started with a goal. It started with, okay, I'm going to discipline myself and I'm going to start not. And I believe back then I was like a book every three months, which is not that crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm just going to chip away at a book every couple months. Now, what it did was it was hard at first. At first, I still had those same kind of thoughts. Like, oh, I could be doing stuff. I'm so slow. Oh, I don't like these things. But then I started to acquire knowledge and I started to see the benefits of that. I saw the benefits of my vocabulary. I saw the things that I was learning. I saw the how it was benefiting me financially, how it was benefiting in my job. And then I started to attach that. And then I started to like the process. And then I started to speed up the amount. I started doing more of it and more of it. And then I started to love it. The fitness thing is the same thing. There's people that get into this and they don't like it. And all that's the loop that's playing in their head are all the negative things. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it's so hard. It burns. Mm -hmm. And I could be doing this instead. I could be doing that. And oh, I'm not seeing the results I want. I'm not good at this. And I didn't, my body still looks the same. And they're, they're attached to all the negative things. Yeah. And you first have to discipline yourself to be consistent with something. And then you try to reframe that that self-talk that's happening. And that's when you start to fall in love with the journey. So I think they go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah I remember, I don't know if it was Jocko or was some other, um, somebody else I heard talk about discipline as being, uh, the more discipline you get, the more freedom it provides. Hmm. And and I always thought like, wow, that's, I totally didn't think about that when I was younger. I always thought that like to be more disciplined means that you have to do a bunch of extra hard stuff and it takes you away from having all the fun and the freedom yep. and, and being able to have all this space to myself when in fact, especially as you get older and you have more responsibilities, the more discipline you get, the more space you create. Yeah. And so uh, this is something I had to learn the hard way by having a lot of chaos and always trying to put things out last minute and, uh, you know, that project's coming up. Oh, my God. And, you know, I wait too long because I'm not disciplined in the very beginning to accomplish it, which then, you know, alleviates a whole lot of stress, a whole lot of chaos in, in my life. So, you know, if you look at it on the other side of that, uh, it really does provide, you know, more, more freedom and opportunity. Yeah, the, the unsuccessful lifter waits for the feelings of motivation. They yeah. wait for the inspiration. Right, or rely on it. Yeah, right. and, and when it kicks in, oh, I'm ready to do this. Here we go. And then they're consistent. And they're, oh, this is awesome. And I feel great. And then that feeling fades. And what they're left with is, is nothing. If you're disciplined, what you're left with is discipline, right? If you love discipline, it's a skill and it's always with you. If you fall in love with your feelings, well, good luck because feelings come and go and it's impossible to maintain that hyper-motivated feeling. You can't even do it with drugs. So oh. discipline is what gets you consistent always and that's a skill that you can always build upon. Now, the next one, this is an important one because successful lifters are people that tend to not have, uh, you know, career ending injuries or injuries that get them to the point where they can't work out anymore. And that is that they, they don't take unnecessary risks. Now, that doesn't mean they don't take risks. There's risks are inherent in any physical activity, including resistance training or exercise or running or cardio. There's always a risk, right? Mm -hmm. It's the unnecessary risks that they tend to avoid. So an experienced lifter who's, been, who's very successful will go into the gym and say, man, I know I could, I feel like I could PR, you know, a 450 pound squat. But they're like, but why? I'm, I think I'm going to stick to my 300 pound squat. I'm going to get my, I'm going to slow mm -hmm. my tempo down. I'm going to make it feel heavier because it's not necessary to go heavy for me to get the type of benefits and results I want. And so they avoid taking these unnecessary risks. And unnecessary literally means the risks that really aren't going to produce 
any better results or success for you. So why do them? Now, for me, this typically means not lifting as heavy as I possibly can. That's where the risks that those are the unnecessary risks I used to take as a yeah. kid, where I can lift more, let me add more weight. Now it's more about I can lift more, let me slow my reps down, or let me get a shorter rest period, or let me see if I could pause this rep halfway. That's how I'm going to make this feel more challenging. Th this to me is uh, you successful lifters don't ego lift. Yeah. And it, it manifests yeah. as PRs a lot of time, but it could even be something as simple. We, talk, we talked recently on an episode uh, about why we don't train together. I mean, we train in the same facility yeah. at the same time, but we actually don't work out together. And part of the reason why that is, is if Sal's deadlifting, and let's say today is a, a heavy five by five day for him, and I have no business doing heavy, I already came out of a five by five phase, to, I'm working on hypertrophy, but then we're lifting together. It doesn't even need to be trying to hit a PR. I just, mm -hmm. because he's lifting heavy, I don't want to have to take, I don't want to have to go put down a, a 145 and Sal's pulling 500 or yeah, something. Right, right. Like I want to be able to show that I can lift almost as much or as much as he can. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to keep that weight on there, right? So. I think it's just not li not ego lifting, not mm -hmm. allowing your ego to get in the way of your decision on what is best for your body. And this one takes a long time. Like I, I still think that this, this is, is like wisdom. Yeah, right? I think yeah. that I'm constantly reminded of this because I still step out of this or make make bad decisions, and I'm quickly reminded of like, oh, that was stupid. I shouldn't have done that, or I don't need to do that. And so I think really good lifters, you know, catch this. They have the self awareness on this before they get themselves in that trouble where they can yes, hurt themselves. This one took me a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the competitive side of things uh, sneaks in there, and it, it is very tempting. Like it's the equivalent of uh, your friend uh, basically, you know, baiting you into a foot race, and and you just and you haven't done any sprinting. Uh, you know, forever, but you know, you, you want to kind of test yourself and you're taking this unnecessary risk, uh, to prove a point, which then may set you back, you know, like substantially after that. And so I've done this many a time with lifts and, and really kind of testing it against other people. Uh, and you know, the experienced lifter and the, the wisdom, you know, I have now is, is really understanding where I'm at and what's going to be benefiting my body the most and, and where I should stick and stay, uh, and, and allow, you know, the occasional test to come in when I'm prepared for it. Yeah. No, this is, uh, when you work on this, it actually helps you build confidence because you're okay with lifting less or not as hard or not as fast, right? Cause you're confident in yourself. You don't have anything to prove to anybody. So I'm going to do this the right way. That's really what it's all about. That's why it's wisdom, right? It takes some experience. I, I've, I was terrible at this for a long time, and it's still something I can struggle with. So what I tend to do is not put myself in situations, like you said, Adam, where this, my wisdom tends to you know, get suppressed and my ego tends to grow. So I don't work out with strong dudes. If I work out with other strong dudes, I know that my wisdom tends to go out the window and then <laughs> my ego starts to inflate, right? So- this is some of the, these are some of the tricks you could do for yourself, but experienced lifters just don't do this. Like when I would manage gyms and the 50 something or 60 something or even 70 something year olds were in there working out, the really good experienced lifters, I would watch them work out and they did not. This, they, there was no ego involved whatsoever. There's certain pro bodybuilders out. I think Dexter Jackson is a great example of this, right? He still looks incredible as 50 something years old. And, you know, that's how he works out. Very, very smart and uh, in pretty much injury-free his almost in his entire career. Now, this next one is a very, this one is really, really uh, characteristic of really successful experienced lifters. And that is if something hurts, they don't avoid it, they fix it. There's a big difference between successful lifters and everybody else when it comes to this, right? Everybody else tends to avoid, oh, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't bench press because it hurts my shoulder. Or, oh yeah, squats bothers my back. I can't do squats. Or overhead presses, nah, it's not good for my elbow or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas a successful lifter says, okay, my shoulder hurts when I bench press. Let me find out why and let me fix it because I want to be able to do this fundamental, foundational human you know, exercise that is a part of human movement. I want to be able to find out why my knee bothers me when I squat. We're we're made, our, our human bodies are designed to squat. If I can't squat because my knee hurts, it's not the squat, something going on with my body. Maybe it's my knee, maybe it's my hip or my ankle or my positioning or my stability. Let me figure this out and fix it so I can go back to doing my squats. This, this one goes really good with the, the previous ones. I don't even know if you ordered these in, in, intentionally like this, but they definitely go hand in hand because I feel like 
the same guy who ego lifts and you know mm. elbows hurt, knees hurt, shins hurt, all these things hurt. Yep. Is also the same dude who rolls into their workout the next workout and they got the the wraps and yes. the straps and the yeah. wrist. Thing. I mean, Everything. Yeah, just, they got all uh, the, the all the gear on and you're asking what's with all the gear and like oh I got bad elbows, yeah. I got bad knees. I've been working okay. out for 15 years. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, like it's still put 500. Right, up. exactly. But then they're still just ego lifting, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, good good experienced lifters uh, don't do this. They feel something slightly off. This is something that. That, uh, again, it's taken years of experience uh, and knowledge, I think, to to figure this out, right? Where instantly, if I feel something off in my body, if I feel a, a knot or tightness or something going on one side of my body, instantly I'm trying to troubleshoot and figure out, mm -hmm. okay, what what's going on or what did I do in my last lift that potentially could have caused this or maybe what was I doing yesterday and what can I do in the gym today to address it? Like, so my workout immediately gets modified. So even if I'm running a maths program, I'm on foundational day two, but all of a sudden I've got, you know, elbow pain. I don't just go through the, the routine because that's what my routine is supposed to be today. I'm now doing things to address the elbow yeah. pain. Mm -hmm. I'm making sure that I'm doing mobility stuff to address probably my wrist and my shoulders before I go in that lift. Even if that means I'm sacrificing one of my lifts that I normally would do in there because I know that is more important for the longevity of, yeah, of my training. Humility is a good word in there or just, you know, remaining somewhat humble because you'll have experiences where it'll humble you, right? Because you get the pain, you get uh, signals from the body that, okay, this is overdoing, this is overstressing the joint. Um, you know, you, the body's screaming at you at this point, like we need to, we need to reinforce and uh, to ignore that uh, is, is definitely something that um, you, you'll see this a lot, especially, you know, with, with competitive weightlifters or uh, because at that point it's, you know, we have to do it by all means necessary when in fact, you know, you're, your successful lifters will then go directly towards the source and, you know, take the time to, to, you know, uh, do the, the unsexy lifts and do the, the, the mobilizing and the strengthening of, of the joints to really support it. And then, you know, it benefits the entire whole of the body. Yeah. Well, look, if I look, let me put it this way. Okay. Imagine if you're normal and then all of a sudden you can't walk anymore because your hip hurts so bad. Do you just not walk anymore? Oh, I can't walk. My hip hurts. So now I stop walking. Well, no, you're going to try to figure out why and fix that so you could do this fundamental human movement. I think the problem is because life has become so sedentary that we no longer consider deadlifting, squatting, pressing, and rowing fundamental human movements because we don't really do them anymore, right? We sit in a chair and we type on a keyboard. So if I never can squat again, I think, well, what's the big deal? Uh, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. These are These are fundamental human movements. And if you stop doing them, there's a lot of things you start to lose. And, and there's this cascading, uh, there's this series of events that is cascading from that. If you stop squatting all of a sudden, well, now you're losing the benefits of squats. And even if you strengthen the leg muscles with other exercises, you'll start to lose the ability to lunge, then to deadlift. And little by little, you start to lose other abilities. So successful lifters look at an issue and say, this hurts. I can't do this exercise. Let me figure out why. Let me fix that rather than let me just avoid that and do something uh, completely different. All right. This next one has to do with nutrition. I think this is important because when we talk about nutrition, about 90% of the people watching this right now are thinking about body composition or aesthetics. Oh, good diet. That makes you lean, makes you look good, makes your skin look good. That's all definitely true. But experienced, successful lifters often look at food in terms of performance. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, here's why. It's very hard to eat unhealthy and to simultaneously improve your performance. Now, you might be able to eat unhealthy and just improve strength, but you'll definitely lose performance in other areas, right? When I say performance, I mean all of it. Your strength, your stamina, ability to recover, inflammation, pain. If you eat to feed those things, right? If you eat to solve those things or to avoid those things or to develop strength, stamina, to feel good, you're probably eating healthy versus if I'm eating in a way to look a particular way, there's a lot of bad, unhealthy things I can do that will give me these short-term aesthetic results. Crash dieting, diet pills, starving myself, you know, those types of things. So eating for performance is a really, really good strategy. And you'll find successful lifters will often talk about food in that way. Well, mm -hmm. this reminds me of the statement that you always love to say, which is the chase health and aesthetics will follow. 
I think that uh, as you get older, you start to realize that, man, it's it's funny. The more I focus on just eating healthy and being healthy, I get all those other things that I was trying to pursue when I was younger. Like mm-hmm. I wanted this this fit physique and I wanted to be able to maintain that. I want to feel good. I want to be strong. I want to be fast. I want to be able to stuff. And yet I'm always trying to hack it with some supplement or mm-hmm. some protein shake or bar or latest thing that came out or hack that when it's like, you know what, if I just focus on taking care of my body and feeding it correctly and giving it what it wants and it needs, it's amazing how those things follow. And I think I think we all go through that phase as an experienced lifters, figure that out, you know, how long it may take you. And I know it took me probably a decade to piece this all together. But yeah, the more I just focus on being healthy, I get all those other things that I wanted anyways. Totally. This was one of my, my favorite strategies with the people who had body image issues or eating disorders is I would always work with their therapist. And one of the things that, and I got this from therapists, they'd say, you know what, when it comes to their food, have them focus on their performance, right? Have them focus on getting stronger, on feeling better, on having more stamina, because then they'll have to feed themselves properly. And so this is part of where this kind of comes from. So you'll see experienced lifters, they'll say things like, oh, I'm going to eat this way because tomorrow I have a hard workout, or this Mm -hmm. is how I'm going to eat afterwards because it helps me recover, or I'm going to avoid that because it gives me inflammation, right? So this all feeds health and performance is closely connected to health, even probably more so than even aesthetics. Now, this last one I think is extremely important across the board for almost everything, but definitely for fitness. And that is that experienced successful lifters don't really compare themselves to other people, mm. just to themselves. You they, versus you. They only compare themselves to themselves. Now, you know, it's funny. As Before we start this, started this podcast, uh, Adam brings up this uh, female lifting competitor, and she probably weighs 150 pounds. Less. And, yeah. uh, maybe less than that. And he's laughing, and he goes, dude, she squatted in this video 405 pounds 10 times. Now, nobody in this room can do that right now. <laughs> None of the men in this room can do that right now. But it also, I don't care. Now, I'm using it as an example because I could very well, you know, it could affect my ego. And, oh, I'm a guy. I weigh over 200 pounds. I should be able to do more than that. I'm going to go hurt myself or do all this crazy stuff to accomplish that. But really, the reality is uh, you don't know anything about other people aside from what you see on social media or what you see when you look at them. And it's also not a fair comparison. The only fair comparison you have, the only real fair comparison, apples to apples, is you versus you. Are you better than you were yesterday? If the answer is yes, you are doing phenomenal. And it doesn't matter how well or bad anybody around you is doing. And it doesn't always have yeah. to translate right into, uh, you know, are you better than yesterday, how you look, or how are you, be- are you better than yesterday, how much you lift? Yeah, like, I'm glad you said there's that. many aspects of improving yourself. That could be your relationship with your partner. That could be your sleep routine is getting better. That could be your energy. That could be your relationships with your friends and family. It could be many other things. It could be you, your growth as far as reading and educating yourself. It doesn't always have to be Am I squatting more? Am I deadlifting yep. more all the time? Because that too can lead to these same these same type of yeah. behavior. So first off, you know, shut off the the Instagram and following all these people that you know you aspire to be like, and quit comparing yourself to them. Focus on yourself, and then also have some empathy. You're not always going to make gains on your bench press and gains on your squat or your deadlift, but there's always room for you to grow and improve and beat the older version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't always have to translate into weight. It you could be bettering yourself in other aspects of life. Yeah. What do they say that uh, comparison is the thief of joy? Totally. Right. right. Because it's there's always going to be somebody out there uh, that has whatever it is that you're you're aspiring to be. They're doing it better than you. Yeah. But like to your point, there's like so many other factors involved that um, you're you're balancing, you're juggling all the time personally. And uh, it's really just where you are personally now as comparison to where you were previous to that or, you know, what you're shooting and aspiring personally to achieve going forward. So if you just stick with that, you're going to be happy with your own personal progress and be a happier person overall. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of speculation as to because we've seen anxiety. I mean, forget the last few years, which have been kind of crazy, you know, and unprecedented, but we've seen. Uh, anxiety rising among uh, the young people in America for a little while now. And they connect it to this, that they are going on social media. They're seeing, you know, prettier people, happy looking people, people with more stuff and more money and better boyfriends and girlfriends and partners and cars. And, and you could have all this great stuff. You could have all kinds of great, good things going for yourself. But when you start comparing yourself uh, you feel bad. It makes you feel inadequate, sad. 
You, you don't have gratitude for what you have and, and what's around you. This is a big problem across the board, but it's a huge problem in the health and fitness space. Like I, I can't tell you how many times I had clients come to me and say, oh, you know, they were sad. And I said, well, why are you upset? Well, you know, I lost seven pounds of body fat, but my friend lost 15. Like you still lost seven pounds of body fat. Like what does that have to do with you, right? Think that way, right? Compare yourself to yourself, not anybody. Now this is, it's okay to admire other people. It's okay to give people accolades, but comparing yourself, boy, is that a big trap and don't fall into that trap. I'd say it's probably the biggest one in the fitness space. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of the guides that we have. We have so many guides and they can all help you with most of your fitness goals. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin can be found at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 